Well, good morning, everybody. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to like remind you, um, next week is our, our Vision Sunday. It's kind of the beginning of a Vision series that I'm going to be I'm kind of walking through um, up, to, up to Easter. And so I really want to encourage you, please don't, please don't miss it. Um, we're going to be celebrating what God has been doing over this past year and how he's been working among us, and then uh, looking forward to the coming year and, uh, and what, what he has for us in our future. And so um, the, the word that's been kind of rolling around in me as I've been just praying through and talking to people is just like, this whole, the whole theme of it is living life on mission, living on mission, living on mission individually, personally, in your walk with the Lord, and also what does that look like for us, for us corporately? And so I've actually uh, created, written like a, a devotional booklet, and we're going to be handing those out. And I have a, a new um, silicone bracelet for you as well, so you can memorize the scripture. And, um, and we'll be giving those out next week and all kinds of stuff. So we've got a lot of things planned. But one of the things that I want to uh, let, you, let you know, if you're, if you're watching online, you're part of our, our um, church at home make sure you go to our website. You can go to nlc.today and there's a banner on the top of the page. You can click on it, put your name and, and uh, mailing address in there and we'll mail you the devotional as well as the, uh, the bracelet and things like that to, uh, so that you can be following along with us as well. So uh, make sure you do that over the next day or two and then uh, so we can get that out so you'll have it next week. Um, all right, so we were kind of like, we, we concluded walking through 1 Corinthians, 18 weeks of awesomeness, 18 weeks of confrontational messages, 18 weeks, quite honestly, of some, some weeks that like were life-changing for people. It changed your, your uh, relationships. It even changed some of your romantic relationships. And I've talked to just a bunch of you. Like God has just been working through uh, the, just his word. And, and just when, when it becomes real to us and, and the Holy Spirit speaks to us through his word um, and you respond to it, God, God just blesses you. And so it's been awesome. 18 weeks, walk, almost five months walking through that, that book together. But last week, I kind of ended, um, you know, that last point where I'm like, hey, everybody stand. Let me give you like a little mini sermon. Um, for those of you who are like, oh, I was sleeping. Um, it, I, I do that little thing. And so I was talking about like this story in John 21 where, where Peter and the risen Jesus get together and on the Sea of Galilee. And there's this whole encounter that happens with them eating breakfast together. Um, and I have not been able to get away from it all week. Like I had another plan of what I was going to be preaching today. And I'm like, okay, fine, fine. Um, I, will, I will preach on <laughs> this scripture. And so um, if you turn with me to John chapter 21, we're just going to, uh, let me give you a little bit of a background in case you're, you have no idea who the Apostle Peter is or you're new to this whole Christian thing. Um, the, the Apostle Peter, he's one of the 12, um, was, a, was known for being passionate outspoken, risk-taking. He was an emotional guy, like kind of just would foot and mouth disease. Like he would just say things and then be like, whoops, sorry, but you can't blame him for being passionate. Um, in John chapter 13, in, in fact, there's this, there's this moment where they're, they're, they're around the, the last supper and they're eating. And Jesus is telling all of his disciples, like, hey guys, look, I'm going to be leaving you all soon. And Peter blurts out, he's like, no, man, I won't let that happen. I will lay down my life for you. It's not going to happen. And um, sure enough, Jesus looks at him and he says, very truly, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows, you're going to disown me three times. Sure enough, John chapter 18 Jesus is arrested. Peter denies even knowing Jesus. So he's like, I'm going to die for you. And then he's like, I don't know the man. Uh, around a group of people huddled around a fire as Jesus is being beaten. Um, it says, I don't even know who Jesus is. So of course now, Jesus, uh, like Peter's like, oh my goodness, like I'm just, I feel terrible of what I've done, all of those things. I'm sure he feels like he's not only disappointed Jesus, but, but kind of disqualified himself from his destiny. Like, I don't know if you've ever felt this way before. Um, you, maybe you've lived perfect lives. But it, for those of you who haven't, like you've been in this place where you're like, my failure makes me feel like I've forfeited my future. Like I, I, I know that I've, like, I've, I've tried following Jesus, but then maybe it was a bad decision or a series of bad decisions that has kind of left you in a place where you're on a path now in your life where you've never imagined you'd be on. 
And like this, this wasn't my plan. This wasn't what I would want. But maybe I, I've gone too far. I've done, done too much. I've, you know, I've just worn out my forgiveness of, of what it is that God had planned for me. So if you've ever felt that way, you're in good company with the Apostle Peter. Um, so why don't you stand with me as we read uh, John chapter 21, and we honor the reading of God's Word. We'll start in verse 1. I, I love, just, so, just for the record, I love this scripture. I love this, this portion of scripture. It's full, chock full of so much goodness. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples. Really quick. I won't do this for the whole time. Really quick. Um, this was after Jesus rose from the dead. So Jesus was dead, buried, three days later rises from the dead. Just so you understand, when it says that Jesus appeared to him, this is the risen Christ. It says, he appeared to them by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Number two, there's two. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat. But that night, they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No. They answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Soon, then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and he jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, maybe about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with a fish on it and some bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you just caught. And so Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? For they knew that it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. Now this was the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he had raised from the dead. And when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yeah, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. Lord, I, uh, I pray that as we, uh, as we get into your word today, that, um, that we would maybe grab and pull from some of the experiences of this hot-headed, passionate, foot-in-mouth disciple um, that maybe can relate to us, those of us that feel like we've failed him, we've failed the Lord in many ways. I pray that there would be redemption, freedom from shame. And uh, Lord, that we thank you for that, that you offer that to each and every single one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. So, um, like I said, I, this, this scripture, I hope, well, I hope it comes to life for you like it comes to life for me when I read it. Um, I, I would advise you wholeheartedly, when you get into the Word of God, allow yourself to just get into it because um, this, this Scripture is chock full of awesomeness. Um, Peter, it starts out with Peter wants to go fishing, and so six of the other disciples go with him. They're like, we'll go with you too. Now, if you don't know this, fishing was many of their livelihoods before they started following Jesus, but specifically Peter, he's kind of the, the central figure in this this portion of scripture that Peter was, was a fisherman, that he's a hardened fisherman. Like this is what he did. This was his business. This was his family business. And some scholars will argue and debate that like his decision to go fishing 
meant that it was a decision to quit following Jesus. Um, now, I, would, I personally don't think that, that the text supports something quite that drastic. Um, we're kind of like feeding into it a little bit more than, than it really is. But I do see seven guys that are like out of sorts. I see seven guys that, that are at some level wondering, what now? Like, what, what in the world are we supposed to be doing? Like, Jesus was like, we were following him, and he was telling us what to do and sending us out, and we're watching him and taking notes and having this amazing experience, and now he's dead, and now he's here, but he's not here, but he keeps showing up, but he's not always with us, and all of this. But like, what now? What, what in the world am I supposed to be up to? And I don't know, maybe you can relate to this, because I don't think you have to be a, a disciple to understand or to relate to this reality that like, you can be following Jesus and also wondering, like, where are we going? Like, maybe you've been following him for years and you're in a new season of life and you're like, what now? Like, what? I used to do this, but now I'm, I'm not doing this anymore. So, like, what, where are we going? Like, what am I doing? What, what should I be doing right now? And so Peter and the other six, they just decide to go back to what they used to do fish. Um, it's interesting to me that um, our past is what many times we, we run to when we're faced with current struggles. Like when we're overwhelmed with, with our present circumstances, oftentimes we are tempted to just kind of like go back to our old ways of coping with things. We go back to like old addictions, old sins, old mindsets, because they, used, they worked, right? I mean, they used to work, kind of, sort of, like for a little bit, like the pill, until it wore off, it worked good. It did, it did its job. Or, or that, that addiction, that, that way of coping, my, my anger made me feel better. And now, but it, it kind of worked, but it didn't. And so these guys decide, you know what, we're going to go back to the thing that we know kind of sort of worked, even though we left it and have followed Jesus. We're going to just, just give it a go. And this is in verse 3. So they went out and they got into the boat. But that night, they caught nothing. It's interesting to me, pause there for a second, it's interesting to me that these guys go out um, thinking that the thing that they're going to do that used to work is going to bring them happiness or bring some sort of satisfaction or fulfillment in their life, and it brings even less than it used to. Like, oh, you know what? We're just going to go back and go fishing, and they fish all night long. Can you imagine how frustrating that must be, right? They're just like, you know what? We have no idea what we're supposed to do. You know what? I do know one thing I can do. I can fish. And they go out to fish and they're like, I suck at fishing too. I'm, I'm horrible at everything. Like I can't do, I messed up with Jesus. I can't catch fish. This is the thing that used to be my identity, how I made money, how I, this is who I am. I can't even do the thing that I used to do that, that brought me fulfillment and satisfaction and identity that I used to, I used to have. And so these guys are, are frustrated. Verse four, it says, early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore and the disciples didn't realize that it was Jesus. Now, if you remember how Jesus first called most of these guys, especially Peter. Um, this is almost a reenactment of that scene. And I think it is intentional on Jesus' part. Like I think Jesus is completely trying to recreate that which, how, the, how he first called them. He's like, this is how you return to me. And um, if, if, this, is, this is a reenactment. I, I love about Jesus is that when when we try to disengage with Jesus, he chases us down with his grace. Doesn't he? Like sometimes we think, man, if I could just, if I could just run away from him, then I'll, then I'll get away from his presence. If I just go hang out with these people that I used to hang out with, then, then I can get away from, from Jesus. And it's, it's this reality that if, you've, if you follow Jesus ever in your life, you find that wherever you are, there he is. And you're like, man, if I just go hang out with these people, and Jesus is like, hi. And you're like, oh my gosh, I thought you wouldn't be here. I'm going to go hang out with people that, that I don't, that I know you, you don't approve of this thing. I, I'm going to go do this. And Jesus is like, I'm here, hi. Like everywhere you go, there he is. And this is what's happening to Peter, then these guys, and they're thinking like, I'm going to go back to the thing that used to bring me fulfillment. And Jesus is like, 
hey, from the shore. They're like, we can't even, we can't even get away from you because he chases us down with his grace. And in verse 5, he yells out to them. This is really interesting. He, he says, friends, haven't you any fish? Now, the NIV translation is being very kind because the actual Greek word that Jesus used for friends is actually children. So essentially, and because my love language is sarcasm, I literally have to think. I, 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 try, I tried hard. I, I read it through a few times. Like, I can't get away from the fact that like, I think Jesus is kind of slipping a little, a little stinger in there. Like he's like, hey, kiddos, catch anything? Right? Like he's, it's, I mean, who calls hardened fishermen children? Nobody, but Jesus maybe. Um, hey, kids, did you, did you catch any fish? And he knows they haven't, right? Because he's Jesus. He knows everything. Um, why would Jesus do this? Why would he call hardened fishermen kiddos and call them out? Because I think that sometimes it is very important for us to, to, re- to have this realization and reconcile with the fact that what we are doing is not working. I think that Jesus was calling them out, maybe shaking them up a little bit for them to come to the realization that the thing that they think is going to bring them fulfillment, identity, and happiness is not currently working. And sometimes, I don't know about you, but I have to have that maybe shooken up in, in me a little bit, that this realization that like, I don't think that we come to, the, come to the place of like, I need help or I need a savior until we are honest with ourselves about ourself. You have to come to the place of just being like, you know what, like life, I'm not doing this life thing good. Like I'm, I have a lot of hangups and hurts and things that are like holding me back. This thing, I'm actually, I, I, I try to, to inebriate myself into thinking that things are going well, but they're really not. Like I need help. I need a savior. And it isn't until you're honest with yourself about yourself that you finally come to the place of saying, okay, I give up. I, in so many words, surrender. And this is what I think Jesus is just kind of poking at them. And in verse 6, he keeps going. He says, hey, I have an idea. Throw your net on the right side. Have you tried the right side of the boat? And you'll find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because the large number of fish. Okay, this is very similar to the first day that Peter met Jesus. I mean, this is like, okay, this is way too similar. Verse 7, Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It's the Lord. Can I just say this? Um, I love how John, the writer of this gospel, always has to point out that he's better than everybody else. <laughs> he's like, yeah, I beat Peter in a foot race to the tomb. I mean, the disciple whom Jesus loved, right? And then he calls himself here again. He's like, the disciple whom Jesus loved knew it was Jesus first before any of them. Peter had like a cool experience, but I just want you to know he wouldn't even have recognized Jesus if it weren't for me, the disciple whom Jesus loved, right? (laughs) He's like ridiculous. And he says it more in here. We'll keep going. He says, as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, who? The disciple whom Jesus loved. Um, It is the Lord. He wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and he jumped into the water. Can I say that sometimes I think that we overcomplicate what it looks like to follow Jesus. Sometimes you just need to find out what the Lord is up to and join him in it. What I love about Peter, this hot-headed, foot-in-mouth type of like just passionate guy, is that like he's the first one. He's the guy that steps out on the water to walk on water. He's the guy to just jump in and swim a football field to get to Jesus, just to be in his presence. Because What we find is that when Jesus shows up, your responsibility is simply to respond to him in his presence. And the way that you first turn to Jesus is the way that you return to him. And this is what I love about Peter. He's just like, man, I'm just going to go hard after after God. And and the reality is is that when we're following Jesus, it's it's not hard, but it may be humbling. And this is, we got a guy who is not afraid to, to be humbled and I think about this, like Peter could have just sat in the boat. He could have just been like, um, you know, 
I deny Jesus three times. I don't really deserve to even be in his presence. I'm pretty sure that is him. Thank you very much, John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, for telling me. But like, I've done too much. I've gone too far. I've strayed too much. It was three times. I didn't just deny him once, guys. It was three times. It was horrible. I'm never going to forgive myself, and certainly he can't forgive me for that. Like, I have done too much. I have overextended and worn out God's forgiveness. He could have just done that. But shame never brings freedom from your failure, shame always keeps you in bondage to your failure. And this is the cool thing that, that, and we said this last week, that like shame is not a tool of the kingdom of God. And so this fresh encounter with Jesus, this is the thing that brought freedom in Peter's life. He just jumps in, not even thinking, and starts swimming. I'm sure the rest of them were like, well, I guess we'll just, uh, we'll roll this boat by ourselves. Thank you very much, Peter. And he just starts, he just starts going. It says this in verse nine. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with a fish on it and some bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you've just caught. Watch what Peter does. So Simon Peter climbs back into the boat and, and, and drag the net ashore. It was, it was full of large fish, 153, I don't know who's counting, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. I think it's really interesting that we have this guy, Peter, who goes from, I just want to be in, in Jesus' presence. Oh my gosh, that's Jesus. And he jumps in and just starts swimming his little heart out to go be with Jesus. Jesus. And then he goes from that to being like a maniac who thinks he's in a strongman competition. I mean, he goes from like, you know, Jesus says, literally, you can read it for yourself. He's like, bring, go, go bring some of, I mean, we only have a fish here and there's seven of you. Go, go bring some fish. And Peter's like, I got this. He goes back in, starts dragging a huge net that was hard for these guys to even bring in in a boat because they couldn't get it inside. He drags single-handedly because he doesn't need help. He brings 153 fish all to Jesus for the glory of God, right? I mean, I'm sure he's like popping his back out of joy. I mean, he is, he is serious because he's going to do this to show Jesus just how much he loves him, Right? It's interesting to me because so many times shame can cause us to overcompensate. We, we, we kind of get to this place of like rather than just being in the presence of Jesus, we start thinking, I need to do something for Jesus. He was cool there for a second, and then as soon as Jesus needed something, he's like, I got it, I got it, I got it. And no, no, I don't need help, I don't need help, I got this, because he's serving Jesus, but it's still out of some shame. Because shame will often get you to the place of like, you're so busy doing things that you forget to simply just be in his presence. And so finally, Peter like catches his breath, pops his back in a joint, and he chills out for a hot minute. And they sit down and they eat breakfast together, which is so cool. Like, can you imagine like Jesus cooking breakfast on the beach and just sitting there reclining, eating breakfast with Jesus? Cool opportunity. And then it says in verse 15, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, he asks him a really awkward question. He says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? more than these? Can you imagine out of eight people sitting around a fire, Jesus looks and singles you out and asks you one of the most penetrating questions that the Son of God could ever ask you. He says, do you love me more than these? And scholars have debated over the years, like what exactly did Jesus mean when he said more than these? Some people think like, well, maybe he meant like, do you love me more than you love these guys, your friends? Do you love me more than they love me? Maybe do you love me more than these fish that you dragged in here and this identity as a fisherman? Do you love me more than your job, your livelihood, the thing that you've looked to to say this is who I am? Do you love me more than that? I think quite possibly Jesus meant all of it. Because if we get hung up on exactly what that he's getting at, I think we miss the point of the question altogether. I think that Jesus is saying, like, do you love me more than life? 
the things that you're running after and chasing after. Because if you do, then I want you to know that my destiny for your life has never changed. Sometimes we think that our failures and our hang-ups and our missteps and our sins have literally disqualified us from the call of God over our life. And Jesus is literally looking and reinstating Peter, and he's, he's just saying, like, your failure has not changed my plan for your future. Your shame has not disqualified you, Peter. And I'm sure it was a bit dis- disarming for him because he says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus says, feed my lambs. And they go back and forth three times. Do you love me? Yeah, you know what? You know I love you, right? Take care of my sheep. Do you love me? Yeah, I said it. You you know what? We already talked. We, We settled this, right? I love you. Feed my sheep. Notice that he doesn't ask Peter, Peter, Simon, son of John, do you believe in me? Do you believe that I exist, Peter? Simon, son of John, do you believe in all of my teachings? Simon, have you memorized all of my doctrines, Simon? It's interesting because he kind of blows past all the important things that I think he should be focusing on. I think he should probably get some of those things figured out, like some of his (laughs) theology is a little messed up, like he should probably get those things kind of buttoned down, super important, but Jesus simply goes right over the top of that and he And he says, like, do you love me? Which seems kind of silly and awkward and unnecessary unless you realize important question. I'm like, really? Is that, and that's the most important? I don't know, Pastor Justin, I think we need to talk about that. (laughs) No, it really is because Jesus actually says it when he's asked, what's the most important commandment? Out of all of them, they're trying to catch him in a lie, trying to catch him in like a, you know, a a, a heresy. What's the most important, Jesus? Way back in Matthew 22, verse 37, this is the answer of Jesus. He says, love. Sorry, let me start over. Love. Not believe. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart. In essence, love him with all your soul, love him with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And then he says in verse 39, and the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And then he says, he doubles down, he says, all of the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. This isn't new, in other words. Like this whole idea of like, do you love me? is not new by any stretch of the imagination. It is quite possibly the most important question. My fear, church, Christians, Americans, is that we've reduced the Christian life to simply what we believe when it is and always has been about who we love. Like, what what if, what if? What if this question is the question that we should wake up to every morning? Like, what if this, it's simple, but it is so penetrating. Like, what if this is the question that we should not be able to get away from? Do you love me? And how tempting it is to, to say, well, Jesus, of course I love you. You don't just see all the, all the things that I'm doing for you? I just hauled in all these fish. You're welcome. You know, like, don't you see all the, all the, all the right things that I'm believing about you? Don't you see all the, all the truth that I'm fighting to uphold for you? Don't you see how I voted? Jesus, of course I love you. And Jesus would look into your eyes and he'd say, yeah, I see it all. I just have one question for you. Do you love me? May we never confuse serving and learning and attending church and leading or even exercising spiritual gifts with loving him. I mean, it's it's the question. 
And it begs another question, which is, how do I know? And this is what Peter's struggling with. Like, you keep asking me three times, so obviously I don't, right? Like, I don't know. What are, you, what are we getting at? I, am I answering incorrectly? Like, how do we know if we love Jesus? Well, look what Jesus says to Peter. And let me just say this before I read it, that I, um, I would not choose to define it the way that Jesus does. In other words, I don't like it either. Okay, um, he says, Jesus says, if you love me, his answer three times are, feed my sheep, take care of my lambs, feed my sheep. Variations of that. He just keeps coming back to the same thing. Now, I don't know about you, but my thought is like, um, how about I just come to church on Sundays? I mean, how about if I give you some money? Like that would, you like tithing, right? That would be good, right? I'll do, I'll do that. I want to make you happy. Um, I'll stop. How about I stop swearing? Oh, that'd be a big one, but I'll do it for you because I love you, right? I mean, like, how about, how about I do some of these other things? And Jesus is bringing Peter as well as you and I back to the greatest commandment again. He is saying, make no mistake, he is saying, if you love me, you will care for what I care for. He's saying, your love for me is not measured by the words that you profess to me. It is measured by what overflows from me through you. If you love me, feed my sheep. And Jesus has some extraordinarily funny sheep, does he not? And you're sitting next to him, come on. Nobody's like, preach, right? I mean, like, come on. This is, he has some bedraggled, dirty sheep. He has some awkward, budding sheep. He has some sheep that have gone astray and are not quite living the sheep lifestyle, right? Like, he has, he has some sheep that just, quite honestly, if we're going to be real, they just need to be sheared. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> come on, preach, right? Like, I want you to notice something that Jesus does not ask Peter. He does not ask Peter, hey, Peter, son, Simon, son of John, do you love my sheep? Because... The, because the probable answer is no. <laughs> no, Jesus. In fact, I wanted to talk to you about that. Um, I love you. Mm, you and me, you and me, you and me. But like they, I don't know, when are they leaving? Like, I don't understand why, why, we're, why, why we're hanging out with all these people. Like, um, I have a hard time with this guy, and this guy smells. And can we shear him? Like, I mean, like, I just don't quite understand why I love you. And we established that you love me and I love you and we're a happy family. But, but Jesus is looking at him saying like, oh, Peter, 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 pumpkin eater. You are not an only child. You are not an only child. If you love me, Feed my sheep. If you love me, then love and care for and feed those that I love and care for. Mm. Because God's sheep can be unresponsive, unappreciative, and hard to love. <laughs> and if you are... Um, serving and loving and feeding God's sheep out of guilt or loyalty to God's sheep, in the end, you will find yourself defeated and discouraged and disappointed. It is your love for Jesus that is the only sufficient motivation that enables you to love and to care for those that he loves and cares for. That's why those two commandments go hand in hand. Like, if you love me, then feed my sheep. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And the second is just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. It reminds me of my, my cat. I don't like cats. Does anybody? 
not like, here, here, thank you. I know there's some of you that are weird. I get it. You're like, and I'm going to make you angry. Please save your emails. Send them to Pastor Tom. Um, <laughs> um, it's not that I hate cats. It's that I just find very little redeeming value in them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Ah, I feel the presence of God in this place. Um, it's, I, so I, do, I don't love cats, but you know what I do love? I love my wife. And my wife loves our cat. She's continually sticking up for that cat. Like, I don't understand why you guys don't like our cat. And she says that all the time. And we're like, my son will attest. He's like, we just, we don't like her. So here's my point. Guess who, guess who feeds and changes the litter box for the cat they don't like? I'm sorry, Ryan. Um, why? Why would I do something like that? Because I love my wife and my wife loves cats. That's, that's what it boils down to. And so whether I choose it or not, that cat is now under my care. That cat is, is now a part of my family. And so if you love God, then you will care for those that, that he cares for. And when we talk about like building a church-like family, we come to realize that, that God loves us, that he adopts us as his, as his child, but you are not an only child. And so as we choose to follow God, there's this reality that we don't follow God alone. It isn't just you and Jesus. It's actually you and Jesus and a whole bunch of bedraggled sheep all around you. Jesus like, wants you to love them too. Huh? Why? How? How? And he's like, well, if you love me, then you'll care for them too. It's out of that grace and love that we receive from him that gives us the power and grace to extend to others who desperately need it as well. And Jesus continues, and it gets even weirder. If you're like, oh, this has been pretty normal, just buckle up. Verse, verse 18, he says to, he says to uh, Peter, very truly I tell you when you, were, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted, but when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then he said to him, follow me. Jesus is literally prophesying over Peter about the way in which he's going to die. A super sobering conversation. I mean, you're just like, oh, huh, okay, wow, we just went there. Um, it's almost like Jesus is assuring Peter, Peter, you're going to make it. You're going to finish well. Yeah, we had a rocky start. <laughs> you had a rocky middle. <laughs> I just want you to know you're going to finish well. The longer I go in this, this Christian thing, the, sim the more I simply want to just finish well. And I used to be impressed by young, hip Preachers who could draw a big crowd and build something. But now the older I get, the more I find that my eyes are on the older men in my life that are finishing well. And you know how I know they're finishing well? They still love Jesus. <laughs> they're still following him. And because of, of that, they can't help themselves but to to pour into and to love the next generation of bedraggled, messed up sheep like me that need their wisdom. Like this is how it's supposed to work in the kingdom of God, in the family of God. I think that this is what Jesus is, is showing Peter. Peter, you're going to make it. You're going to finish well. You may have denied me. I just want you to know you're going to honor me with your life and your death. Why don't you stand with me? All right, here's my mini sermon for this week. Uh, 
Peter and Jesus have this amazing moment, okay? It's like awesome. This, wow, okay. And then I almost imagine that they're like walking kind of side by side together and everyone else is kind of following. But there's a conversation that everybody else is listening to. And Jesus is talking to to Peter. In verse 20, it gets really interesting. It says, Peter turned and he saw the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. And then in parentheses, just in case you were wondering, John made it sure that he says, this was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and said, Lord, who is going to betray you? Can I just say, I think I'll leave it here. I think John may have benefited from some counseling if he... He could, have, he could have used it. I'm just saying. And then it says this in verse 21. It says, when, when Peter saw him, he asked this crazy question. He asked this question, uh, Lord, what about him? I want you to understand what's happening here. Jesus is telling Peter about in the way in which he's going to die. This is a sobering conversation. And he's like, look at Peter, you're going to finish well. You just keep your, you just keep following me. And then Peter looks behind them and he asks, well, what about John? How's he going to die? <laughs> I'm not kidding you. Are you kidding me right now? That's the best question ever. Like, he's like, what about, uh, what about that guy? How's he going to die? Like, what in the world? This is, a, this is like, the, this is such an amazing question. And, and let me just say this to you as, as a word of caution, is that when you take your eyes off of the Lord who is beside you, you will be tempted to stare at the Christians behind you. Let me say that one more time so you fully stings. When you take your eyes off of Jesus beside you, you will be tempted to look at the Christians behind you. What do I mean by that? Well, this is what I mean. I think you're probably a whole lot better than me, so I'll just be, be real. I get distracted when I think that other people are more, are more blessed than I am, especially when they don't deserve it like I do. Come on. Preach, right? Come on. I get distracted when I look at other Christians who I think have it easier than I do, especially when I'm going through a really difficult season and they're not. I look back. I get get distracted when I think that, that God's plan for their life is better than God's plan for my life especially when I am working hard and doing things for him. And so Peter, Peter asks, what about John? How's he going to die? Look at Jesus' answer, verse 22. Jesus says, it's epic, drop the mic. He says, if I want him to remain alive until I return. What is that to you? Whoa. He says to Peter, and I bet he had eyes that looked right into his soul. He says, you follow me. In other words, Peter, I'm sorry. I thought we were talking. What what about him? What what if I made it so that he never dies? What if John never dies? What does he have to do with you? Keep your eyes fixed on me. You follow me. Church, God's plan for each and every single one of us is exactly the same. Follow Jesus. And maybe today you can relate to Peter where you're like, man, I just, (laughs) you feel like your failure has kind of like determined your future, your your mess ups and screw ups and hang ups and things have just kind of like ruined the thing that God had for you. Or you feel like your present struggles are causing you to just like go back to, to past things. Or maybe you've taken your eyes off of Jesus beside you and you're comparing yourself to Christians behind you. 
and you find that you are disappointed, <laughs> you, you are struggling, you are frustrated, and you are thinking about going fishing. Yeah. May you be confronted with the question of all questions. Do you love Jesus? Yeah. I do. I do. Then follow me. Feed my sheep. <laughs> care for those things that I care about. Do you love me? As we... Uh, as we worship today, I just want to encourage you. Maybe you come to this place where it's like allowing Jesus to bring you back to your first love, to bring you back to the place where you first met him, realizing that he is not asking you to do more, to serve more, to give more, to do things. He's saying, I, I just want you to come and to be in my presence, to just be, stop doing. I'm not asking you to drag 150 fish in a net up to me. I'm just saying, will you just be with me? Sit with me. Lord, I, I pray that in this place, I pray for each and every single person that we would be confronted with that question that does not bring shame. It actually is the only thing that releases us from shame is your love. And it's out of your love for us that we don't, it is absolutely preposterous and we don't deserve that we can love you back. Lord, I thank you <laughs> that I can love you because you first loved me. May it overflow in my life. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Let's worship together. <laughs>